Okay, I always, I hate being introduced as a security expert because there's nothing worse than raising the expectations of your audience only to dash them dreadfully shortly afterwards. Um, my academic qualification is actually in psychology, not in computer science, just to, to lower your expectations. What I want to try and do during this short uh, burst is to talk a little bit about the Internet of Things and security from our perspective. I'm not here to try and persuade you our perspective is the best, but actually probably to show you which way the industry is going and actually what that might mean for some of you. Just for my benefit, how many people here are either in the development or manufacturer or researching around the Internet of Things? So how many people, okay, perhaps about 60, 75 percent. Okay, that's really good. Because at the end, I do actually want to try and induce some of you to actually come and develop on that platform. And I'll talk a little bit about uh, why at the end. So let's talk a little bit about why the Internet of Things changes the way that we need to think about security. And this will not be new to you. But it is new to a lot of the organizations you will deal with. For my role in the company, I spend much of my time talking to governments around the world, but increasingly enterprises in all sectors, about what they need to do to change their business to capture new business and do it securely. And what I'd say to you is in almost every sector, organizations are a thousand miles away in security terms from where they need to be. And it isn't a technology issue, because actually, if you go to the chief executive of a bank or a hospital and you ask them what's on their mind, security is now one of the first things that comes up. So you have to sort of say to yourself, so if everybody knows what the problem is, and actually most people have got a realistic idea about what the answer to that problem is, because things like the UK government's 10 steps to cyber security just been updated, but that's been around, what, three years now? And, you know, if you follow that as an organisation, big or small, the reality is you'll mitigate an awful lot of the threats against your organisation. So why isn't it happening? And you sort of have to think about it's because of the change management aspects of it. So a lot of organizations built a security model around the way they started to do business. I would say when I go to look at a government in particular, I can usually tell what the IT security model of an organization is by looking at the way the building is built. The bigger the fences, the more armed guards there are outside a building, you can pretty well guarantee that the computer and IT security model will be based upon a whacking great firewall and then keep your fingers crossed and hope that nobody ever gets through it. Um, and actually, the Internet of Things changes that. Yet most organizations don't even realize they're part of it. Hospitals now, you look at things like blood transfusion meters, you look at oscilloscopes in research labs, they're all connected to the internet or to it networks internally in organizations. Yet, very, very rarely is there any level of security either on those devices or on the network. They've sort of fallen into the internet of things by accident. Hey, we've got acrobatics going on at the same time. I'm very impressed, Simon. So the security model of most organizations, whether they realize it or not, is actually redundant. The world has moved on, but the security architecture of organizations hasn't. Very few organizations have any form of intrusion detection, network monitoring. Very few organizations know what's normal on their network. And if you don't know what's normal on the network, it's incredibly difficult to know when you've been compromised or whether somebody's penetrated you. So the idea that the firewall is the all-protecting thing has long gone. But at the same time, 
banks want people to be able to bank using smartphones. They want people to be able to pay using things like my Microsoft Band or an Apple Watch. And increasingly, the idea of business is that business is done on a myriad of devices. Even governments want to get people to report crimes over mobile phones through data links. So the security model, even if it exists, is riddled with holes all the way through. And as Simon said at the beginning, when you start really to think about what the Internet of Things comprises, and you can look at Gartner or Forrester, and you will get figures about by 2020, there will be 40 billion, 50 billion, I don't know how many there'll be. There are going to be a lot of devices, a lot more than there are now. Just looking around this room, it's really interesting, because we've got controllers that it took a while to fiddle with that lower the screen. We have lighting controllers. We have all sorts of interesting embedded systems just in this room that are all linked into system, systematically into something somewhere that may or may not have a back end with some security in it or not. So where do we go with this? Because this impacts on privacy too. And you can't talk about security without thinking about the privacy implications of it. And data and privacy are becoming more important. So if you want to do business and your security is poor, you may not be able to do business because your privacy implication. And interestingly is the baseline deployments when you come to talk about the Internet of Things is pretty poor. There are a number of reasons why security isn't built into the Internet of Things devices. First is no one ever thought about it till about three or four years ago. So it just wasn't actually on the agenda. The second is if I'm developing something that makes my vacuum cleaner connected to the Internet, what's the acceptable margin in manufacturing costs to bet for that connectivity? If you're talking about £100 for a vacuum, perhaps 105, 110 for a connected vacuum. So the costs you've got to actually build something in security are very, very limited. And if you're talking about a $10 device, then actually the security margin that's going to be acceptable, frankly, isn't going to exist. So it becomes a real issue about the devices themselves. The second is a lot of devices, the embedded systems in this room, they're designed that you put them into the building, you put them into the factory, and you leave them. And 20 years' time, you'll go back and you'll change it, and that will be the only maintenance you will ever do on that. So the idea about how you update that, how you patch that, that was never in the operating environment for the design of those. And we are lumbered with millions of devices out there that are probably running on 30-year-old software and hardware that will be there for another 10 or 15 years yet in every sector that you talk about. There is no real security standard when we talk about this. Actually, there's too many security standards, but none of them are used uh, universally. And many, uh, particularly when you talk at the consumer level, when I go and talk to people who develop IoT, but and I come to places like this, and I see people who are doing it, how do they get the software? They often will go to Google Store or somewhere and download software kits. And they'll put the software kits together with a bit of hardware and you've got an IoT device. The problem is there is awful lot of malware in many of the publicly available software kits. We know it. Most people know it. But the problem is that people are still using them and there's almost no control on that. Now, all of that sort of makes life a bit challenging, but there is a case for security. And for those of you who are thinking about the developing, I'd, I'd sort of say have a think about this. Certainly governments, if you look at the UK government as an example, there are three schemes in the UK government, all of which are around minimum standards of security if you want to be either engaged or supply chain for the UK government. Enterprises, companies like us, we are really careful about who goes into our supply chain. And increasingly, you are going to see legislation and regulation, meaning that if you want to do business, you're going to have to prove your security credentials. 
and that will be at the level of device or network. So there are some economic cases, even at the consumer space. Windows 10 for us and increasingly other companies' operating systems are going to be more geared to a lockdown environment where you're going to need to have permission from the operating system to operate whatever it is. And if you're not an accredited device, you probably won't get it. So moving forward, there's going to be an impact on people who are developing in this space. If you don't have a level of security, you probably find your market will decrease. And the days of the Wild West in the app stores where you could just build something and stuck it out there and people will download it or buy a $2 device, you'll probably find those days will go. So let's just do a very simple deconstruction. And I apologize, because with this audience, this will not be new information to you. There are three bits to securing the Internet of Things. The first is we have the ubiquitous connected sensors and devices with a little bit of software on them. Um, the second is you have the network that you need to secure and the back end, which is the cloud joined services, aggregating data and actually making these devices come to life. And if you want a security model that's coherent, it's actually got to be coherent over all three of those. And there's a bit of a problem, because that first one, that's really difficult. So if you sort of work on the basis that we have legacy devices out there that are going to be there for years to come, that the marginal cost of introducing good quality security into devices is going to be pervasive for the foreseeable future, and we don't really have security standards on the devices, thinking that your security strategy is going to be based at the device end is probably not going to get you very far. That doesn't mean that designers shouldn't design it in. And one of the things I would say is I'm staggered by how many little devices that I look at that find they're actually not just transmitting, but they're actually listening for unsolicited traffic. So what you have with some of these two, three dollar devices is they're little servers, but they're little servers without any security in them whatsoever. And that's something that could be designed out. So the second part is, so if you're not going to secure the device, where are you going to put your security to try to do this? And what I want to do next is sort of just show you our approach to this. And again, I emphasize, I'm not here to sell you our way of doing things. But you'll probably find that what you see here will be mirrored by the other large manufacturers because, frankly, there really isn't much of another alternative. So with us, it's around um, Azure and our Internet of Sweet things. And I, and I genuinely do apologize. I hate doing stuff that talks about products, but there's no really better way to talk about our approach than saying what we're doing here on it. So basically, we have an Internet of Things suite that is our connected part of this. And the idea of the IoT suite is you can, you can link up literally millions of devices to a hub within your network, and it will create a registry. And effectively, it will register all of those devices. And I'll talk in a little bit about what type of devices it will register. And then we'll process that data to predict trends and do the stuff that people want with device data. And the security side of that comes with what we're calling the Internet of Things hub. And this is the bit where the hub will sit, if you like, between all of the devices that you're listening to and the back end network. So as opposed to try to secure the devices, effectively what this becomes is a gateway to your devices. So you may, you're really sort of saying, well, if I don't trust you, device, you can set by policy, depending on the type of organization you are, what that happens, whether that means you won't be able to allow that device to communicate, or perhaps you quarantine or sandbox the device until you're happy with it. Um, but the principle is it will not allow insecure connections. Now, there's obviously a bit of an issue here, because remember what I said about all the legacy devices? So what are you going to do with these devices that are out there that, frankly, we know aren't going to be secure? They're in untrusted environments. Even if they were secure when they put out there, who's to say I didn't come in last night with my screwdriver 
and change that device that's on that pillar that controls the way the screen goes up and down. Because if that is connected in some way to your back end network, that actually could be the attack vector route in. And if you look at uh, some of the major attacks over the last couple of years, people are, in, are looking increasingly and actually very creatively about where you can attack vector into an organization. So we're seeing far more attacks now that are vectored in through third party organizations where the security environment is, uh, is weaker. So this enables a federated identity, but there's obviously a sort of back end to it, which is that actually we're looking for people to start to develop uh, applications and devices that, are, that we can actually accredit. And it doesn't have to be for a Microsoft platform. It, we, we're producing this for multiple platforms. The idea is it's a common set of standards. And if you produce your device to that set of standards, then our back end and hopefully other people's back ends will recognize, the, recognize those devices in the future as trusted and facilitate bi-directional communication between them. Now, I suspect looking at what our uh, partners and competitors are doing in this space, it's very much along the same lines. So the key thing for us is we are looking to try and get people, particularly people who are looking at hardware, developing hardware, to actually come on. We're supporting people. So if you are a hardware developer and you're interested in this, the website's down at the bottom, uh, talks about the support we give to people to develop hardware in this space. So to conclude, the bottom line is there is a huge appetite in business for the Internet of Things, because it is genuinely transformational. If you look in the health sector, just in the health sector, and look at the connected medical devices that will enable people to be monitored in their homes as opposed to hospitals, the cost saving and the impact on people's personal health and their personal well-being is, is, is very, very difficult to quantify, but significant. But each of those devices is linked back into a hospital or a doctor's system. It has to be. That's the whole point of it. So if you can't secure this, you have the danger of those devices actually either corrupting data or worse, in some cases, looking at the destruction of data through those attack vectors. So there's a real need to move forward on this and to take notice of those legacy devices. Um, so that's our approach to it. We think that industry will be going in that direction and we're really keen to get developers on board. I think, Simon, you're taking questions at the end of the three sessions? Uh, yeah, we're doing a panel Q&A at the end. Good. So if that's you wrapped up. That's me wrapped up and Fantastic. I will. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Bob. Round of applause. Thank you.